This podcast is for general information only and does not constitute any form of advice and tax allowances and rates are subject to change. So on today's Medics Money podcast, it's my pleasure to welcome Steve Nichols, who's making, I think this is your podcast debut, Steve, although you were just telling me that you went viral on TikTok. (laughs) Yeah, I've been viral on TikTok, but yes, this is my podcast debut, so I'm looking forward to it. Brilliant. And we're just going to be talking about sort of tax efficient ways of trading. And of course, we can't talk about that without talking about electric cars. But before we do that, can you just give yourself (laughs) the introduction? Because you've been looking after doctors for a few years now. Is that right? I have. Yes, as you can tell, I've been in this industry and looking at, you know, with a specialist firm of medical accountants for probably about 25 years now. And we look after all types of medics, so GP practices, hospital doctors, consultants, I mean, anything and everything, really. And, you know, I think we do a pretty good job. We, we never, ever lose clients, which is, a, which is a good sign. It's a big part of our business. And we've got about most, not, not, not all members of staff, but most senior members of staff are sort of a, a specialist in doctors and doctors' pensions. And so we can help with most things which come up. If you've got a query or a problem, we hope we'll have come across it before. So we should be able to help you. Absolutely. And we talked about TikTok because it was actually your daughter, Amy, who got you set up on Medics Money and we're delighted to have you. And she's also an accountant. Is that right? Yeah. Amy's a chartered accountant. So she qualified with one of the large firm of accountants, KPMG, but she didn't enjoy it much. So she said, "Uh, can I come and work for you, Dad? So I said, yes. And then she came in and now she's running the firm, basically. She tells me what to do mostly, particularly to do with uh, things like Medics Money and TikTok and LinkedIn. You know, that's much more her expertise than mine. So, but anyway, it's lovely. It's great. It's a thing. I love working with my daughter. I mean, it's great teaching her and helping her. I mean, it's brilliant. I never thought it would happen. She was never interested in accountancy growing up. You know, she was sort of in nightclubs and that sort of thing. Went to college got a job as an accountant and now she's working for me so I love it it's great yeah that's really I love that like the family business is going to continue and yeah she's dragged you into TikTok in the modern age so you went viral on TikTok (laughs) talking about uh, electric cars was it yes and I've got a little I think you're going to ask me about that today and I'll be talking about that today as well perhaps definitely because what I wanted to talk about today is you know the pros and cons of different business structures because you know one of the most common questions we get is you know should i set up as a limited company but there's actually a lot more to it than that because you can be a sole trader limited or llp so can we go about what are the main kind of structures you see doctors using and then talk about the pros and cons of them yeah sure i mean that's a question i've been asked for years I mean, for the past, I don't know, 20 years plus, people phone me up and say, you know, I want to be a limited company, they say. And I say, well, hang on, before you say that, let's just talk about it and see if a limited company suits you. And in the past, limited companies very often were the answer, but not so much now for everybody. But in particular circumstances, they can be terrific. And so I'll go through all that with you today. I mean, I think the three main structures that we work with, as you say, are a sole trader structure, a limited company, and then LLPs. So if I just quickly run through each of those, and let me start with the LLP structure, if I may. That's the structure we probably work with the least. But where an LLP structure is very, very useful is if there's lots of medics working together. So for example, we work with an LLP where I think there are about between 30 or 40 consultants who work together to provide a radiologist services up in London. And the way they've structured their business is through an LLP. And there's two great advantages to an LLP. One is the flexibility. So if you've got 40 people working together, they're all going to have different profit shares. And with an LLP structure, you don't have to issue, you know, shares A limited company sometimes can be inflexible. But with an LLP structure, whatever the profit share is, you know, one person's doing one day a week and somebody's doing, you know, five days a week, seven days a week. The profits are different. So it accommodates very, very flexible profit structures, which is very useful when there's a lot of you. The other thing that it does is, of course, to be a member or a partner in an LLP, you can either be an individual or actually you can have what's called a corporate member. So if you're a doctor who's set up to trade in a limited company and then you want to get some of your income by trading through an LLP, you can have your limited company as a member of the LLP as well. So there's very, very flexible LLPs and are particularly used when 
particularly consultants work together for profit sharing arrangements. The other thing that's particularly good for LLPs, of course, is if you are all working together with a traditional partnership and somebody makes a mistake, then legally you've got this joint and several liability. The beauty of an LLP is that if one partner or member makes an error, all the others are not liable for his or her error. So there's two great advantages there for LLPs. One is the flexibility and one is the legal side of things. Any questions on that at all, Tom? Are you happy with that? Anything you'd like to comment on? Yeah, I think the overriding theme of today is going to be that, you know, all of these structures can make sense in the right circumstances That's and right, you need yeah. to get professional advice because I see way too many doctors who go set up a limited company themselves you know, don't even set up a separate bank account, don't do any of the legal stuff because their friend did it and saved a ton of tax. So I think getting advice is the main thing. But I think, yeah, so LLPs, as you say, locally, we have some urologists who do private work and yeah. they do it via an LLP. That's the reason. Uh, yeah, I don't and... think there's particularly tax saving advantages, but very practical advantages, particularly for profit sharing and liability from a liability point of view. Yeah, great point. Um, there's more to life than tax. Exactly. Yeah. I think the other thing is that when a client phones up, I think I said before, a clients often phone up and say, I want a limited company. And really, that's completely the wrong approach. What I always say to clients is, don't tell me, please, you want a limited company. Tell me what you want to achieve. So, you know, they might phone up and say, I want to pay the minimum amount of tax. And then I'll ask a series of questions, run some numbers and say, well, look for yourself. This is the way to do it. But certainly in NLP, it's not a great tax saving way of doing things, but it's a very practical way of doing things. And it works very well for lots of people, but like your urologists, you know, that's good. The other thing I'll just say about LLPs, it's not particularly simple, you know, it can be a little bit complicated to understand, and it's not a particularly cheap way of doing things, you know, there are costs involved. A simple and a cheap way to do things, of course, is to be a sole trader. And as I say, over the years, there was always this weight between should I be a sole trader, should I be a limited company? And in the past, certainly, we were recommending limited companies a lot more than we do today. I mean, I think what's happened with limited companies and sole traders is the government have sort of made dividends, you know, much less tax efficient, companies much less tax efficient with the mini budget. They've just confirmed the rates going up to 25 percent corporation tax. And so really now the two ways of trading, sole trader versus limited company, there's not a great deal in it, particularly if you're going to draw and spend everything that you earn. And, you know, certainly unless you're a sort of a more senior doctor with a high income, you probably are going to draw and spend everything you earn because, you know, life's expensive. Not many people can leave money in limited companies for tax planning reasons. So more and more with the question, should I be limited? Should I be a sole trader? First of all, we're saying, well, let me run the numbers because that's always the case on everything. But very often we're saying, no, sole trader is probably better because it's simpler, it's cheaper. And the tax saving is not that substantial anymore, if at all. So that's the second one, the sole trader. It's a cheaper, it's simple to understand, and it's not bad for tax. The other thing I'd say about sole trader, again, if you're doing NHS work, it gives you the opportunity to make a pension contribution into the NHS pension scheme. At your age, you probably don't want to think about pensions too much. At my age, you don't think about anything else. You know, it's a great scheme. I know I've heard on your podcast, you, you know, it's much better than anything than buying the private sector. So certainly I see that as quite an advantage of a sole trader structure. So I think the sole trader, it's simple, easily understood, cheap to run. You can make pension contributions and the tax savings with the limit, you know, compared to the limited company for most people are not that great. So then the third structure we typically work in is a limited company. And there are lots of things you can do with a limited company, but again, depending on your circumstances, and there's a few things we're going to talk about today, but again, it's not for everybody. I think it's fair to say if you're drawing out most of your income and spending it most of the time, then there's not going to be much to choose between the sole trader structure and the limited company structure. But if you are a higher earning doctor and if you're able to, you know, perhaps leave some funds in a limited company, then certainly a limited company structure can work very well for you. And there's lots of sort of little bespoke tax planning items that you can use either individually or in combination with each other, which can make a material difference to your tax. And we do lots of work like this, particularly with some 
well, I suppose it's fair to say with some higher earning doctors, but it doesn't only apply to higher earning doctors. And, you know, there can be some substantial tax savings. So I think the first thing to say about limited companies is they've just become less attractive because the tax rate on corporation tax has gone from 19 to 25 percent with a marginal tax rate in between. So that makes them less tax efficient. But certainly the thing that people never used to understand was when they say, well, look, the corporation tax rate is 19 percent. I'm a 40 percent taxpayer. What they never appreciated is once you take the money out of the limited company by dividend or salary, there's additional rate to tax to pay. And that, well, that was, as you say, that was a very common question we we're asked. And it shows a misunderstanding of the situation. And once you take into account that, as I say, these days, sole trader and limited company, there's not much to choose between them. I think one thing you can't do with a limited company is you can't pay into the NHS pension scheme that you can with a sole trader. As I say, if pensions are important to you, then that's an issue. It certainly would be for me. But again, what I think a limited company can give a taxpayer is flexibility around their own situation. So if your circumstances change, whereas if you are just a sole trader, you have no flexibility. You earn the money in that year and it's taxed in that year. With a limited company, you can earn the money, pay corporation tax on it, but maybe you can borrow money from the company. Or maybe you can declare a dividend if that's the right thing to do. Maybe you can pay a wage to a spouse or a family member. There's lots of flexibility with limited companies and lots of ways we can take advantage of them. One way which has become quite popular with lots of clients of mine is clients who are approaching and going over the £100,000 income level. Now, again, I know that you know, but maybe some of your listeners don't know that once your income exceeds 100000 your marginal rate of tax becomes 60%. And you can actually be paying 60% tax, perhaps 2%. If you're making superannuation contributions on that money as well, that could be an awful lot of deductions coming in that section of your income, which is over 100,000, between 100,000 and 125,000 pounds. Well, if using a limited company, you're able to slot that top section of your income into a limited company, for example, keep you out of the 60% tax bracket. And then let's say you need to draw that income out of your company, but perhaps you have a low earning or a non-earning spouse, you could perhaps pay them a dividend and draw the money out in that way. So that's an example, a very simple example of the flexibility of limited companies, where you can sort of shift income from you to the limited company. In this example, it's kept you out of the marginal rate of tax, and, you know, you can perhaps draw that income out by paying it to a spouse by a dividend or a salary. So that's what I mean by the flexibility of a limited company. Whereas if you're a sole trader and you earn £125,000 a year, let's say, then you earn it and you pay the tax at 60%. There's nothing you can do about it. No flexibility. Another massive flexibility with using a limited company is around the pension because, you know, there's potential for making big, big savings here. So could we talk a bit about the flexibilities that the limited company affords you from a pension point of view? Yeah, sure. Okay, so limited companies and pensions, there's two aspects I like to look at with limited companies and pensions. One thing which I think is quite nice is let's say you have a limited company and, you know, you're a doctor and you have a spouse and you've got an NHS pension. And maybe the spouse doesn't have a pension at all. Perhaps that spouse is not working or would like to get a bigger pension. Then if that spouse works for the company, then that company can pay that spouse an additional pension. So, you know, that's quite nice. So very often we might have a spouse who's not working, who helps with the doctor's private practice. Perhaps he or she is a company secretary. And we say, well, look, don't pay that spouse a salary. Well, why doesn't the company make a pension contribution for them? perhaps £500 a month, £6,000 a year, that goes into the spouse's pension. So if there's a couple, the main doctor's got his NHS pension, but at least the spouse has got a pension as well. So that's quite a nice thing to do. And lots of my clients like to do that. The other way that you can use a pension, again, you may or may not know that when you make pension contributions, everybody has an amount that they can pay into the pension each year, which they can receive tax relief on. So it's 40000 a year. Now, if your earnings are high enough, and they've really got to be quite high at the moment, that amount that you can pay into a pension each year and get tax relief on is, they call it tapered, it's reduced. So the pension contribution can be tapered down to £4,000 in certain circumstances. So what that means is, it, let's just say your pension contribution is 40000 a year. If it's tapered to four, 
then the difference between the two, £36,000, you're taxed on that. And if you're taxed at 45%, then obviously that's quite a big chunk of tax. So if you can, again, move income from yourself into your limited company, then it will stop you from reaching the level of income personally where your pension allowance is tapered or reduced. So again, what we're doing is we're shifting income from an individual into a limited company. That keeps the individual's personal income level low. They don't reach the level at which their pension allowance is tapered. And so they don't get a tax charge on this 36,000, the difference between 40 and 4,000 pounds. So again, that's one of these things where you can be flexible, you can move income around and you can avoid a pension tax charge. Is that clear? Have I explained that okay? Yeah, I think so. But let me just run it back so that to make sure that everyone's got it. So yeah, let's sure. say hypothetically, you're a consultant and you're earning 100,000 in the NHS and 150,000, so 250 total from your private work, okay? Yeah, yeah. And you're doing it as a sole trader, yeah. right? Because your income is over 200, then you would be subject to tapering well, of your yeah, annual allowance. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. But if you did that exact same scenario, 100,000 NHS, 150 privately via a limited company, and you retained that profit within the company or didn't pay it out, then you would avoid being tapered, even though you're earning exactly the same amount, but you've got a different business structure, which allows you to not be subject to the taper. Is that that's right? A, that's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, not 100% right, but about 95%, good enough, right? So by just shifting your earnings out of your individual name and into the name of a company, then yes, you can avoid the taper. And if you're a 45% taxpayer, you know, then 36,000, what's that? You know, that's 16 or 17,000 pounds worth of tax that you've avoided by doing that. And once your income is in your limited company, there's a lot of other things that you can do with it. You could pay your spouse a pension, you could pay your spouse a dividend, lots of things. So yeah, but that's correct. Can we talk about that now then? So paying your spouse a dividend, because that's a question that we get asked a lot. And it's a area where you don't want to get it wrong okay yeah well i mean with limited companies there was a famous tax case ages ago called arctic systems I get confused with arctic monkeys but anyway it's called arctic systems and it established that if you have a limited company and let's say there's a doctor who's working all of his or her income goes into the limited company it's been established and it's been accepted now for many years that you are able to give shares in that limited company to a spouse and it's very flexible. When you give shares to a spouse, there's no tax consequence to doing that. But particularly in this kind of personal service company, you can transfer shares between a spouse as often as you like. You could transfer shares, you know, which gives, again, flexibility. And so let's say you wanted your spouse to own all of the company. You know, you could do if you wanted to. Perhaps you'd give a spouse 99% of the shares in a company if you wished. We normally don't do 100%. We normally just do 99%. And there's no tax consequence to doing that. Even if you're doing all the work, earning all the money, then your spouse can own all, you know, nearly all of the company if that's what you wish. And the advantage to that is, let's say you're a doctor who has an NHS income, which is making you a higher rate taxpayer. You earn a private income, which is paid into a limited company, and you give a shareholding in that company to your spouse. And let's say your spouse isn't earning anything. Then you could pay, for example, a dividend of 50000 to the spouse, and he or she wouldn't be a higher rate taxpayer. Whereas if you had paid that dividend to yourself, or if you had earned it in your individual capacity, you would have been paying 40% tax. So what we've done is we swapped 40% or 45% tax, or even 60% tax, for probably 12,500 of income at nil rate in the spouse's hand, plus, you know, 37,500 at a 20% tax. So it's a great saving. Now, the other thing to say about that is the spouse doesn't have to do any work. As a shareholder, you're in the same position as if you're a shareholder in BP or Shell or any company. You get a dividend from BP and Shell. You don't have to work for BP and Shell to get a dividend. You're a shareholder. And this is the difference between paying a salary or paying a pension to a spouse and paying a dividend to a spouse. A salary or a pension paid to a spouse really has to be earned by the spouse. So they have to work in the company. But a dividend doesn't. A dividend is paid to a shareholder and a shareholder doesn't have to do any work in the company. 
So that's the advantage is splitting income between spouses. Again, using a limited company is a very flexible way to do that. Makes sense. It's accepted by the revenue. We've done this for years and, and lots of accountants have, not just us, you know, lots of accountants do it. And it's not just for medical people. It's, for, you know, my own company is owned half by me and half by my wife. She receives a dividend. I receive, you know, it's absolutely accepted practice and lots and lots of people arrange their affairs in this way. Yeah. And you're just thinking about tax as a family, really, as a whole, aren't you, really? And spreading the allowances around a bit. That's right. And the other thing you can do is other family members can be paid. I mean, if you have other family members that you want to pay, I wouldn't give other family members dividends without thinking about it carefully. But certainly other family members, if they work for the company, they can be paid a salary. The salary should be commensurate with the work that, you know, it should be a commercial salary. But that can be paid to a salary. So, for example, if you ask a family member to help with notes or some admin work and, you know, you might pay them a modest amount. But, you know, what that's doing is it's shifting income to that family member who might be a nil rate taxpayer or a basic rate taxpayer away from yourself. And you might be a 40 or a 45 percent taxpayer. So that's quite allowed. It's not an issue at all. That's just absolutely bona fide. eh? Yeah, perfect. Okay, And so more benefits of the limited company. We're going to get to electric cars, which is what everyone is obsessed with at the moment. Before we get there, can we talk about university fees? Oh, well, this is something that people have got different ideas about this. Now, I think it's a great tax saving scheme. One thing I would say is all of these ideas must be done properly from a legal point of view. That's very important. So, for example, if you're going to have a personal service company and you're going to make it into a sort of a mini family investment company and have members of your family included in the company, then the first thing to state, the starting point really, is that the articles of the company, that's really the regulation and the rules surrounding the company, that's all got to be done absolutely properly. And that's not always cheap. And it's not very expensive, but there is a cost to that. So first of all, you get your company set up properly. And then what the idea is, you give your adult children, so you can't do this with school fees. It has to be adult children who are university. You'd give them what's called alphabet shares. Have you come across that phrase before, Tommy, at all, alphabet shares? Yeah, I have, actually. Okay, But I think we should explain it for the benefit of everyone. So these are just shares in your company. So you as the owner of the company or the primary or the director might have ordinary shares. And then you might give your children alphabet shares, just call them ABC shares. And these shares would entitle them to a dividend, but probably wouldn't entitle them to a vote and probably wouldn't entitle them to other rights. And the beauty of this is that if you've got your company, it's earning money, it's paying corporation tax. And then if you're going to help your children at university, the normal way to do this, let's say you're going to pay your children's fees and accommodation and everything. Let's say you're going to give a child £20,000 a year to get through university. Quite generous. Then in order to get £20,000 into your hands, let's say as a 40% taxpayer, you're going to have to pay yourself a dividend of £33,000. You're going to have to pay £13,000 tax on that dividend, which will leave you with £20,000 that you can then give to your adult children to pay their university costs well the other way around that is instead of that why don't you vote a dividend on the alphabet shares the a share to your son or daughter so they get a dividend of twenty thousand pounds because they're not a 40 percent taxpayer they're a basic rate taxpayer and they've got a personal allowance of twelve and a half thousand pounds the tax on that dividend voted to them will be about 600 quid So in order to get £20,000 into their hand, if you do it in the traditional route, let's say, it's going to cost you about £13,000. If the dividend is voted directly to them, then the tax will be less than £1,000. So that's the advantage of using Alphabet shares with a limited company paying for university costs. I think it can make a lot of sense if you're in this position to maximise your position that you're in, you know. And if anyone is out there earning a lot as a private doctor you know you are doing a ton of work so you know thanks for all the hard work you've done and if you get it right you can get your share structure set up in a way that benefits you and i think the other thing to say is don't try and do this yourself you know use a professional to do this because if you get it wrong it's going to be expensive 
Well, I think so. That's why at the beginning of this, I said, you've got to get all the legal stuff right. It's got to be done properly. But it works well. I had a client this year. He's got two daughters starting university, I think, shortly. One's doing an architect's course. I don't know how long that takes. Is it seven years? I'm not sure. And one's a medic. So, I mean, he's going to be paying a lot of money out for a long period of time. And he's in exactly this situation to be able to do this. And so I think we're going to be able to take advantage of it. Amazing. Okay. Another thing that we get asked a lot as well is, you know, I like cricket or I like tennis. Can I use my limited company to well, this to fund is, that? This is, yeah. So I was asked by one of my clients who's a great cricket fan, works in a cancer doctor, but he said, Steve, I want to buy a debenture with the MCC so I can get tickets for the test matches. He says, best if my company buys, he's already got a limited company. Is it best if my company buys that debenture? Or should I buy it? A debenture is just a loan. It's a loan you make to the MCC for 80 years. You know, so what it'll be worth when you get the money back, I don't know. So I said, well, how much is a debenture? He said it's £17,600. So that, that gives you the right to buy tickets for all the test matches and everything. So if he'd taken a dividend from his company and left him with £17,600 to buy the debenture, he would have had to take a dividend of £29,333, pay tax on that of 12000 to leave him with the money to buy the debenture. However, if the company buys a debenture through the way that benefit in kind rules work, there's no benefit in kind. The company buys a debenture for 17,600. There's no tax charge. He can still do exactly what he wants and buys the tickets. If he uses the tickets, he'll have to reimburse the company the price of the tickets. But again, it's a material tax saving, nearly £12,000. If you've got a company anyway, why wouldn't you get your company to buy your debenture for Wimbledon or the MCC? You know, it makes sense. It's just, I mean, obviously, that's not everybody's going to want to know about that. But I just thought it was an unusual thing we've dealt with recently. I thought I'd just chuck it in. Also, like for a hardworking cancer doctor, like you said, it must be really rewarding for you, Steve, to be able to kind of help those kind I mean imagine the amount of people that that cancer doctor is helping on a daily basis and then you help them out with something like that it must be pretty rewarding for you yeah I like it I find it interesting I mean I love my job it's interesting these little things that I'm asked to do I quite enjoy working on them you know someone says well you know this is a bit of an issue can you sort it out for me and get it sorted out in the best tax way I enjoy it you know I'm not a very popular thing to say, but I enjoy my tax and accounting work. I enjoy it. You know, it's good. I like it. Yeah. And obviously your daughter does too. And that's why she, <laughs> yeah. I, I just love that she works with you. Right, okay. Yeah. The right. next bit is basically what everyone came for. People are obsessed with this at the moment. And I can kind of understand why, because it does make a lot of sense. But talk to me about buying an, a fully electric car like a Tesla buy okay. a limited company well this is something that i mean i bought a new car a couple of years ago and i don't know why I, I didn't do this myself but i didn't i don't know why but so let's just say then you're a doctor i mean i've had exactly this example actually several several times you're a doctor you've got a private practice and your private practice earned a hundred thousand pounds in profit in a year let's just say and you said i want to buy a tesla so you buy a tesla for a hundred thousand pounds so what happens to your company corporation tax? Well, what happens in the first year, the cost of that Tesla is risen off against your profit. So you make profit of 100, you buy a Tesla, your taxable profit is nil, so your corporation tax bill is nil. So you can't get any better than that, nil. Now, the reason people often don't buy company cars is because of something called company car benefit in kind. Well, if you buy a Tesla for £100,000, this is what the benefit in kind is. £100,000 multiplied by 2%, because that's the benefit in kind rate on a nil CO2 car like a Tesla. So that's £2,000. You then multiply £2,000 by your tax rate. And if you're a 45% taxpayer, which you probably are, if you're buying a £100,000 Tesla, then you get a tax bill of 900 quid. So you save £25,000 in corporation tax when you bought the Tesla, because we've got the new corporation tax rate at 25000 You've had to pay £900 in tax on the Tesla. So that's £75 a month in tax. So that's a pretty good deal. But let's just compare it with a petrol car. Let's say you buy a petrol car, like a big Range Rover or a Jag or something that's belching out CO2 emissions. Let's say you spend £100,000 on it. Well, the benefit in kind tax on a car like that might be 17000 
So that's 17,000 out of your net pay, out of your back pocket compared to 900. That's the first benefit, which is quite a big benefit. Secondly, let's look at how it affects your company. Well, you probably get an allowance on that car of 6,000 pounds compared to an allowance on the Tesla of 100,000. So your corporation tax bill is going to be about £23,000 compared with the corporation tax bill of zero. Can I just clarify that point? Because this is a key point, basically. What you just said is that you're deducting the whole cost in year one of the Tesla, and that's how you make the corporation tax saving. Have I got that right? Yes, that's absolutely right, yeah. It's a first-year allowance, and it's deducted in year one, and it's not a grey area or, you know, it's absolutely correct. That's why the government have done it, because they want to encourage people to buy these cars. Now, what I would say is, you know, I've had clients who've been doing this for a number of years now. I suppose it probably started about five years ago. People were jumping on this bandwagon, and they've done very, very well. Some of them have got two Teslas in the company you know, husband and wife, perhaps. One thing nobody knows is what's going to happen to the benefit in kind rates and the corporation tax rates on Tesla's going forward. So we think for 22, well, for 22, 23, we know the benefit in kind rate is 2%. It works for this tax year. We think it's going to work for next tax year and the year after, but we're not too certain after that. As we know, we were joking at the beginning of the podcast about the mini budget. It's flip-flopping. They're changing their mind. Of course, they could tomorrow say we're putting tax on Teslas. You just don't know. I don't think it's going to happen. And I could never see it would be worse off than buying a petrol car. But there are certainly great advantages to buying one of these CO2-free, totally electric cars. It's got to be a new or a demonstrator. It can't be a second-hand car. That's uh, disappointed a lot of people who perhaps can't afford 100 grand and think, well, I'll go and get a second-hand Tesla. That does not work the same. So that's not going to work for you, I'm afraid. It's got to be new or a demonstrator. And the revenue do look at that. I have had a case myself where the revenue have queried with a client, is it a new car? So they do look at that. But, you know, other than that, it is what it says on the tin. I mean, it's a great tax deal. I, I wonder why I didn't do it myself, to be honest, when I bought a new car a couple of years ago. Yeah, and I think you can also get subsidised charger installations and yeah. electricity as well but maybe well that's too much detail but yeah that's i guess why everyone is so into well, it well, because... don't, don't forget when you have a company car everything to do with that car can be paid by the company so the insurance the servicing if you have servicing on a tesla i don't know if you need it really yeah the installation as you say all of that's included if you like so it's a very good tax deal if you've got a hundred grand well you can finance it obviously you can borrow the money you don't have to do it all in one go but yeah no that's a really good deal if you want to get a electric car then it's got to be done in a limited company actually we did have a gp practice where they all bought teslas and actually it's wrong it's completely wrong they haven't really gained much tax advantage at all it has to be done in a limited company. It can't be done as a partnership, a sole trader. Well, obviously you can do it, but you will not get the tax advantage as a sole trader, a partnership or an LLP. It has to be done in a limited company. It's to do with the benefit in kind rules and the capital allowance rules. Perfect. This next one is something that I know absolutely nothing about. So I'm going to be paying close attention. And that is a money box company. What is that? Okay, well, this is something that is still quite popular. I mean, they've been around for ages. The revenue, I thought the revenue were going to do something about them. They had a sort of a thing about money box companies, but it's really just a name for a company where you store profits or store money in a company. And again, a lot of my clients have done this over the years. And to have a money box company, you've got to be in a situation where you can afford not to have to draw out of the company and spend your income. So it's a way that you store up profits. And you might say, well, why do I want to store up profits? This is the reason. Because if you draw money out as you go along by dividend normally, then you're going to get hit now for 39.35% tax on that dividend if you're a marginal rate taxpayer. So lots of people say, well, look, I don't need the money. I don't want to draw it out and spend to get hit with that tax bill. Is there anything I can do? And of course, what you can do is leave the money in the company. You have to pay corporation tax on the profit. Leave the money in the company. Don't draw it out. Don't pay 40% dividend tax. Then eventually, when you say, I've finished it, I'm going to call it a day. What you would do then is you would liquidate that company. You have to do a formal liquidation now. Can't do an informal one. And then you would draw out all of those undrawn profits as a what's called a capital distribution. And the key thing here is a dividend is not a capital distribution and is taxed at 40%. A capital distribution 
up to certainly a million pounds per taxpayer could be taxed at 10 percent so if you can save up a million quid in your company over you know let's say 10 years and draw that out when you retire properly retire then you know that will come out as capital be taxed at 10 percent a hundred thousand pounds well if you draw it out as a dividend as you go along it's going to be taxed in your hands at 40 percent that's 400,000. So you can see with these money box companies, if you can afford to do it, there's a substantial saving. Now, what you can't do is have a money box company and liquidate it every year. That's called phoenixing, and that's not allowed, because otherwise everybody would do that every year and everybody would pay 10% tax. That's not allowed. The other thing you have to do with a money box company is you do have to properly retire. So what that means is, you know, if you're a medic, it means you've got to stop medicine. You know, you can't say, well, I'm not doing it through my company. I'm doing it in a partnership or an NLP or a sole trader. What you can do is go and work for somebody else. That's OK. As a salaried employee, you could do that. But if you retire with these money box companies, you can get these funds out and pay 10%, which I'm sure you probably have heard the phrase entrepreneurs relief, or it's now called business asset disposal relief. Even if you don't pay 10% for some reason, you're going to pay 20%. That's the highest rate of capital gains tax at the moment. So it's a great way to do if you can leave the money in there and you don't need it. Now, the other thing that I would say is at the moment, lots of people are saying to me, this isn't a very good idea, Steve. And I say, well, what, why, what do you mean? And they say, well, hang on, inflation's 10% now. If I leave my money in the company, you know, it's eroding. If I've got 100,000 in there next year, it's going to buy 90,000 pounds worth of goods. And what we used to advise people really was to leave this money in the company in cash to make sure they got the 10% tax rate. And when inflation was low, people didn't seem to mind that. But certainly in the last six months, lots of my clients have been saying, look, inflation's too high. I cannot leave this money here as it is. And so what a lot of people are doing now is it's not really money box companies. They're actually investing the money. They're putting the money into the market and they hope they're going to get a return, at least to keep pace with inflation. And what they're saying is, well, if I have to pay 20% when I take the money out, which is what happens if you don't leave it in cash, probably, then I'll do that because 20% is still better than 40. And I'm not happy to leave my money in cash or just on deposit getting a silly rate of interest when inflation's 10%. So that's something that's changed with these sorts of companies. The other thing that you can do is you might say to me, well, hang on, Steve, that's a long time to leave money tied up in a company 10 years. What if I need the money before the 10 years is out? You know, what if I want to pay off my mortgage, for example, let's say, and uh, I want to do that because my mortgage rate just gone up, my fixed rate deal just finished, and my mortgage rate's 5% now, it was 1.2. Why don't I just pay it off? It's ridiculous having this money in the company and paying this huge amount of mortgage interest. And what you could do in those circumstances is borrow money from the company. And again, that's allowed. That's The Companies Act allows that for a private limited company. You can borrow money from the company. And what, I mean, this does tend to get quite complicated now, so I'll try and keep it simple. What you can do is borrow money from the company and what the revenue say is if you're going to borrow money, if the company can afford to lend you money, it can afford to lend me some tax. So you have to lend the revenue tax at 33%. And that's fine. So but you've borrowed money from the company, you've paid off your mortgage now. And that's great because you're not paying these high mortgage rates. And then what you do is when you finish your 10 years and you retire, what you do is you basically have a capital distribution and what happens is that means that that triggers the revenue repay that tax to you. So the tax that you paid is repaid to the company, I should say. And then you have a capital distribution, just as we discussed before, and you pay tax hopefully at 10% or 20%. So it's a way of paying off your mortgage and the money you've drawn out of the company to pay your mortgage off is taxed at 10%, not 40% income tax. So that's tricky. If people are interested in that, they'll have to probably get professional advice and find out exactly how it works. But the thing is, this sort of planning can make such a substantial difference that it's well worth paying for some proper professional advice and going into it. Because, you know, if on hundreds of thousands, we're talking about changing a tax rate from 40 to 10%, then, you know, it makes a real material difference to people. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a really good point. And once you're earning a certain level of income, it opens up all these opportunities, but you really do need advice to do any of the stuff that we've talked about today.
The last thing I want to talk about is something I'm sure you get this all the time as well is about, I mean, doctors seem to love property investing, owning buy to lets via a limited company. Well, I'm asked this all the time. I mean, buy to lets have become just in the past, I don't know, three weeks, I'm having loads and loads of clients phone and saying, what am I going to do? My interest rate's gone up from maybe two point something. I, I think next year I might be paying five or 6% on my buy to let properties or my buy to let portfolio. Obviously, you only get tax relief at basic rate now. I mean, on a buy to let portfolio, it's terrible. You know, it's a terrible tax situation to be in. If you're highly leveraged, you can be paying tax on sort of more than your economic profit, the profit that you're really making. And so lots of people, obviously, property investment's been a brilliant investment, so, you know, for years and years, I don't know, 30 years plus, probably. And lots of people have got buy to lets, but, you know, they're going to be struggling with them now, particularly highly leveraged people. And people are saying to me, look, can't I put it into a limited company? Because the difference is if it's in a limited company, you get tax relief on your interest and also limited company rates. If you can leave the profit in the company, you know, you're probably, if it's just one buy to let in one company, you're probably going to be paying 19% tax on that. However, unfortunately, if you've got one or two buy to lets, almost certainly the answer is going to be no. Because if you put your buy to let into the company, you're going to pay capital gains tax on the market value of that property to get it in. And you're also going to have to pay stamp duty. So again, we're always being asked that. And for most people, the answer is no. Now, there are lots of people out there floating schemes where you can get buy to let properties into partnerships and then into limited companies in clever ways that they say does not attract stamp duty and does not attract capital gains tax. But I think I'm very skeptical about a lot of these schemes. And I would certainly anybody who you know has heard of these schemes, seen them on Google and wants to go into them, I would say, please talk to a chartered accountant and just get some advice on these because it reminds me of the tax schemes that were very popular maybe 10 or 15 years ago that lots of footballers and celebrities went into, Jimmy Carr, for example. And they, of course, all unraveled. But at the time, everybody, they were all told that these were bona fide A schemes and everybody went into them. And then when they unraveled, they were very sorry they went into them. So... I think that's what these schemes are, but you have to wait and see for the results on that. But certainly with one or two buy to let properties, it's going to be very difficult for you to get them into a limited company without paying quite a big substantial tax charge. I think the old rule of if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is it would apply to those schemes that you're talking I think about. So. Yeah, yeah, I think so. It's very difficult because clients say, Steve, Steve, it definitely works. I've been to a seminar. It works. It works. The room is full of people. And it's very difficult to say to a client, yeah, I think it's wrong. I'm sorry, because they want you to say, yes, it works. But I don't think it does. Well, that's what people pay you for to, you know, give your yeah. professional judgment on these that's things, true. which is yeah. why it's invaluable. <laughs> that's why you don't right. get your financial advice from TikTok, except for Steve's <laughs> video, which I'm sure is excellent. I'm going to check it out after this. So let me just get this straight with limited companies and property. So if you already own the property and it's not in a limited company and you want to transfer it to a limited company, you're basically pretty stuck because of capital gains tax I that you have so, to pay. Yeah. But if you're so. starting from scratch and you were thinking about doing it, then it might, might, not advice, yeah. make sense to go straight limited. I think so, yeah. yeah. I, th I think if you're starting from scratch, it makes sense. What I'd say about that is often the mortgage rate can be a bit higher if the limited company borrows money. And the thing that nobody seems to know about is that if you buy your buy-to-let in the limited company, that's great. You get tax relief on all the interest. You might have to pay a little bit more in mortgage rates, but that's all good so far. But just beware, when you sell that, when the limited company, I should say, sells that property in the future, the limited company is going to pay corporation tax on the profit. So we know now that's 25%. When you want to then get that money out of the limited company, if you do it by dividend, for example, we know now you might be getting hit with another 33% tax or 40% tax. So if you've got a property in a limited company, watch out for that double taxation at the end. Because if you have a buy-to-let property and you sell it and it's owned by you as an individual, the tax rate is 28%. So that's a lot less than 25 plus 33. Yeah, great point. Steve, that was amazing. We covered so much ground there. That was brilliant. I'll put your contact details in the notes below. And can you send me your TikTok? Because there's plenty of really, really terrible information on TikTok. And I think it's really important that we promote the benefits of expert advice. So can we link to your TikTok as well? 
Yes, of course. Yes, I'll do that. Yeah, lovely. Uh, and you mentioned the LinkedIn as well. Are you? Is that you? Or okay. Amy? Yeah. So we're on, I'm on LinkedIn, and I do you know just different videos about all sorts of things on LinkedIn. So yes, I mean there's all sorts of subjects on there. I would imagine electric cars are on there. I can't remember, but yeah, we're on LinkedIn and TikTok. So we try and get information out there, you know, as often as we can. So yeah, please look up Steve Nichols on LinkedIn or on TikTok. Yes. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time and your expertise. Delighted to have you guys on board at Medics Money and look forward to you coming on the podcast again in the near future. Okay, lovely. Thanks very much. Thank you. Take care.